Okay, it's one o'clock here in Kentucky in the Eastern Time Zone, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. We appreciate you coming to attend our webinar today and looking forward to talking to you about what we have. Great to see such a great sign up for this webinar and looking forward to short sharing the information that we have today with you. My name is Jeffrey Buley, and I'm the Analytics and Innovation Scientist at Holstein Association USA. And I worked on this project with two of my colleagues at Holstein Association, Lindsay Warden and Darren Sheffield. The title of the presentation is A Million Reasons Why Confirmation Matters. And the reason why we use the term a million reasons is because we had a really neat opportunity to work with a data set with a million cows in it. We're looking forward to sharing the results from some of the analysis that we did. So we've often thought in our careers, what should a ideal dairy cow look like? And this is something that's debated a lot with a lot of different opinions. A lot of us were involved at some point in our lives in either dairy cow judging or dairy cow showing, and that's really fueled a lot of the discussion. And linear type classification programs like we have at Holstein Association are really designed to quantify physical confirmation. As a breed, the Holstein has really improved dramatically over the last century. And as that's happened, the emphasis on confirmation and what that animal looks like has changed quite a bit. It's really amazing when you look at the modern Holstein compared to the Holsteins that were originally imported into the United States long ago. And we continue to make progress. I think just back to the cows that, that we had when I was growing up, they look tremendously different than our current cow. We've made so much progress. And Really, I think important sometimes to step back and think about that progress and how great our confirmation is as a breed overall. Why does confirmation matter? The reasons that we think confirmation matter include that the utter confirmation affects longevity, mastitis, and the performance of the cow in the parlor. Foot and leg confirmation affects mobility and longevity. Dairy form and strength affect the production capacity of an animal, and functionally correct animals tend to last longer and produce more milk. Yet, throughout the industry, opinions vary a lot about how much emphasis we should place on confirmation in selection and culling strategies. From one end of that spectrum, we have people that say that confirmation doesn't matter at all. We'll either just breed for production or breed for fitness traits and ignore confirmation in our genetic selection strategies. Then there would be a, another group of people that would say that functional confirmation does matter and improve profitability. And maybe the other end of that spectrum is people focused on animals that do well in the show ring. So there are different thoughts and of course, varying opinions along the spectrum for how much emphasis we should place on confirmation. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on myself before we get into this study, because I, unlike many people in the dairy industry, did not grow up on a registered dairy farm. You see a picture here of my grandfather with our grade dairy Holstein and me in the milking parlor as a high schooler. I came from a background of thinking about the animal or from a milk production only perspective. As I got into high school, I had the opportunity to participate in dairy judging and started learning from Dr. George Hershey actually about how to think about the confirmation of the animal more. But my background was a little bit different than those that were involved in, in showing and, and thinking about the registered animal from the time they were little. So what we wanted to do is set out to understand the relationship between physical confirmation of the animal and linear trait with some economically important outcomes. And the outcomes that we chose to look at in this study were first lactation energy corrected milk, lifetime energy corrected milk, somatic cell score, and longevity. 
I want to get into just a little bit of information about how we designed the study and what we did with the data. So we used classification scores from Holstein Association to set the database for the linear classification. We looked specifically at the first classification score for a cow assigned to an animal in her first lactation. So that was to make sure that we limited the amount of bias for animals that were scored only because they needed to be scored to improve their score. This is just the first score from the animal. And we used official DHI records for production and culling data. We included data only for cows that were born after January 1st of 1990. We used lactation starting between January 1st of 2000 and August 27th of 2021. For the lifetime production analyses, we used only the first six lactations of data. We only looked at cows calving for the first time before January 1st of 2016 and lifetime analysis. And the reason for that is we needed to give those animals enough time to express their lifetime production. And we only included animals that had complete 305 day lactations in the 305 day milk analysis. Only first lactation records with age at first calving between 18 to 35 months were included. So we, we excluded animals that calved at extremely young or extremely old ages. <clears throat> we removed lactations if the number of milkings was more than three times a day. And that left us with about a million cows in the final data set. In the end, there were over 50, almost 5,500 dairies included in this analysis. And one of the important parts of the data analysis was that we only included a cow in the final data set if she had at least five herd mates in that herd year and season of cattle. This is to make sure that there were comparable cows within a herd to be able to use for the comparisons in the statistical analysis to remove the potential for some preferential bias that might occur. And because of that, there aren't a lot of animals in this study from smaller herds. Most of the herds that would be included in this data set are from larger herds. We then categorized cows into quartiles for each trait so that we had about the same number of cows in each category. So four categories of animals based on each trait. And we used some statistical procedures to look at correlations, frequency, and we did what's called a mixed analysis and an, an ANOVA analysis to model for first lactation energy corrected milk, somatic cell score, lifetime days in milk, and lifetime energy corrected milk. And we used something called a compound symmetry covariance structure. Our subject was herd year and season and milking frequency was included as a covariant in some of the models. So what did we find? That's the little bit of the meat for those that want to understand sort of how the sausage was made. But what did we find? The results to me were very surprising and very interesting. First of all, let me set up what we're looking at here. In this graph on the y-axis, we have first lactation 305-day energy corrected milk. And on the x-axis, we have the first lactation final score broken down into categories. And what you can see here is that as animals progressed up this final score category, the first lactation energy corrected milk also increased. So the highest production average was for those animals in the 85 to 89 category. The next was for 80 to 84, and it just progressed on down to those animals that were less than 60. And in total, we compare the bottom category to the top category, that's an 1,800 pound range in milk production. And at $20 milk, that's about $360 worth of milk revenue. And it's kind of interesting and neat that we have this stair-step pattern. It, it does continue to increase all the way up that pattern. <clears throat> then we looked at the same type of analysis, but instead of first lactation energy corrected milk, we looked at lifetime energy corrected milk. And here we see that the differences are even more pronounced. Those animals that are in that top category had an average lifetime energy corrected milk of 
86,000 pounds. And then it just stair steps down to those that had less than 60 of 57,000 pounds. And that's about a 29,000 pound range in milk production between the lowest scored animals and the highest scored animals. At $20 milk across those animals' lifetime, that's $5,700 difference in milk revenue. Where does a lot of that come from? It comes from simply that those higher scored cows <clears throat> stay in the herd longer. As you can see here, those in the 85 to 89 category were in the herd for 955 days. Those in the less than 60 category were in the herd for 679 days. That's almost a full lactation difference between the lowest and the highest scored animals in how long they stay in the herd. And we can look at this another way, just looking at the percentage of animals in the herd at six years of age, that top group, 36% of them still in the herd, the bottom group, only 12% of them in the herd at six years of age. When we looked at some of the other data, again, we, we looked at quartiles, and you can see here that we have the first lactation average somatic cell score based on the quartile of final, like final score. And these differences are definitely not as large as what we saw for some of our production and longevity metrics, but there is a significant difference, a statistically significant difference. And the most important thing that I think we can glean from this is that we're pretty much the same in these top three quartiles, but it's that bottom quartile that we see a higher somatic cell score, those animals with a final score of 50 to 76. And I think you're going to start to see that that trend sort of resonates throughout this data set. For the most part, we're good in these top three quartiles for a lot of traits, but when we get into the bottom quartile is where we start seeing some of the differences that are economically interesting. Another thing that we did here is we looked at the correlation between each linear trait and our economic interest variables. So here we have the correlations with first lactation energy corrected milk. Correlations, in case you don't remember, a zero means there's, there's no relationship at all. And a one means there's a perfect relationship. So what we see here is these are ranked from the top to the bottom with the highest correlations at the top. You can see here that rear udder width and dairy form are relatively highly correlated with first lactation energy corrected milk. Udder depth is actually negative, negatively correlated. What that means is, is cows with a deeper udder produce more milk in the first lactation. Body depth and strength, greater outer height, stature, and foot angle are also more correlated with uh, first lactation energy corrected milk. Rear leg side view, we have to read that with, with caution because it's actually an intermediate trait and correlations are, are not really designed for intermediate analyses. And then we get into some of these others where the correlations are really close to zero, which, which means basically there's not much of a correlation there at all. Then we look at the correlations with first lactation mean somatic cell score. Here we see some of the opposite trends and, and we're looking, here we prefer the correlations to be negative. So we want a lower somatic cell score. So animals with a more shallow udder have a lower somatic cell score, four udder, udder cleft, Front teeth placement are also associated with lower somatic cell score. Actually, dairy form is associated with a little bit larger, higher somatic cell score. And then we get into some of these body traits that we see the correlations are, are pretty minimal. And that's probably not so surprising with somatic cell score. Then we look at the correlation with culling age and date. So the age when the animal was culled. And we can see that our highest correlations are mostly with our udder traits, fore udder, rear udder height, udder depth, rear udder width, foot angle, thorough width, and dairy form. And then we have some of these other traits that don't have much of a correlation with culling time. This is probably the one that, that I find the most interesting, and these are our correlations with 
lifetime energy corrected milk. The traits that are most correlated with lifetime energy corrected milk, rear udder height, rear udder width, full udder attachment, dairy form, foot angle, and udder cleft. And you notice how some of these are very different rankings than what we saw in the first lactation analysis. So what we might want for more production in the first lactation may not necessarily be what we want for having an animal that produces a lot of milk across her lifetime. We're also looking here at um, some relationships in quartiles for lifetime energy corrected milk compared to some of our, our classification categories. So here we have dairy strength. And what we see is that those animals in the top quartile for dairy strength do produce more milk than animals in each of the other categories. And again, the difference is the largest for this, this lowest category. So the animals lacking dairy strength would be the ones that we see the, the less, least production on. <clears throat> Here we see rear legs side view. And this just kind of reflects that we have the intermediate optimum, the, the animals in the two middle categories would produce more milk than the animals with either extremely sickled or extremely posty legs. And notice on all these slides, we also have pictures here to designate uh, what these traits look like, what the scores look like. So this C category here, the yellow bar represents sickled legs and the blue bar represents posty legs. Feet and legs breakdown. Animals with a higher feet and legs score will produce more milk in their lifetime, and that kind of stair steps across those categories. Stature against first lactation milk production, we see that those taller animals do produce more in their first lactation. We'll see that that doesn't reflect the same when we look at lifetime energy corrected milk. Dairy form, not surprising that animals that look more dairy, that have more dairy form and dairy character, produce more milk in their first lactation than the animals that have a, a lower dairy form score. Rear udder height, again, animals with more higher rear udders, wider rear udders produce more milk in their first lactation. The same story here for rear udder width. Four udder attachment across the animal's lifetime becomes important. So animals with a stronger four udder attachment will produce more milk across their lifetime. Animals with higher rear udders produce more milk across their lifetime. Animals with wider rear udders produce more milk across their lifetime. And animals with a stronger udder cleft will produce more milk. But it's important to note here that among these three categories, there's not a lot of difference here. The real difference, again, is in that bottom category. So we're OK in these three top categories. But when we go into the lowest category for an animal with a weaker cleft, then that's where we're going to see more of, of a concern or more of an issue. I think foot angle really jumps out when we look at, at lifetime energy corrected milk. Animals with a steeper foot angle will produce more milk across their lifetime. And again, all these top three categories essentially about the same, although they're statistically significantly different. It's that bottom category, the ones with really low foot angles where they would produce less milk in their lifetime. Dairy form, animals in the top three categories really, again, do pretty, pretty comparable in terms of lifetime energy corrected milk. But those animals that, that show less dairy form are ones that produce less milk in their lifetime. Utter breakdown, this really jumps out. Pretty big difference here in lifetime energy corrected milk between the top category and the bottom category. Animals with a, an overall better udder conformation will produce more milk across their lifetime. Feet and leg breakdown. Again, when we start taking these things and we put them together, we see bigger differences. Again, about 10,000 pounds difference in milk between the animals with the best feet and leg score versus the animals with the lowest feet and leg score. Rump angle, another intermediate trait, where we see that the, the two middle categories, we have the highest production, but if we have higher pins or extremely slow pins, then we have lower, um, lower milk production in the lifetime. 
stature, if you remember when we looked at first lactase and energy corrected milk, it showed an advanced stature. But when we look at lifetime energy corrected milk, it actually shows that we have the opposite trend where these extremely tall animals do not produce as much milk in their lifetime. Rear leg side view for lifetime energy corrected milk. Again, we see that intermediate optimum. Foot angle, same story as we saw with first lactation where we have this lowest category is probably the one where we're going to see some issues for foot angle. Feet and leg breakdown versus lifetime days in milk. Animals with better feet and legs spend a longer time in the herd. And again, when we look at rear leg side view, we are aiming for that intermediate optimum for uh, lifetime days in milk. Stature, this is kind of reflecting what we saw in the, the lifetime energy corrected milk. Animals that are, that are in the tallest category do not spend as long in the herd. Percentage of herd in the in the herd at six years of age, those that have the highest breakdown for udder stay in the herd longer than those with the lower breakdown. Same story for feet and leg breakdown. <clears throat> Somatic cell score, we see a little bit more pronounced differences here when we're looking at the udder score versus just looking at the final score, where again, these animals with, with poor udder confirmation tend to have a higher somatic cell score. Poor udder attachment is, is a big part of where that's coming from. Udder cleft, we see the same trend. Udder depth, we want a shallower udder. So those are some general, um, general results. So there, there's a lot of data there. There's a lot of graphs that, that I just showed you. And there are a lot more because we really broke this data down in a lot of different ways. We just picked some of what we thought were more of the interesting stories from the data. But all of that information, all the graphs that we put together are available on our website. And we'll show you the, the link to that here at the end. A few things we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about this analysis. We need to keep in mind that these are phenotypic and not genetic relationships. We need to remember that correlation does not equate to causation. That means that just because two things are correlated doesn't mean that one necessarily causes the other. And of course, when we're talking about variables like milk production, days of milk in, in the herd, and somatic cell score, there are lots of other factors that affect these outcomes. It's not just what the animal looks like. This is just one of many factors that affect what the animal does in her life. And we do need to keep in mind that genetic evaluations already account for milk yield potential, productive life, and somatic cell score. So these are already factors that are accounted for in our genetic analysis. In the end, though, I think one of the important take-home messages from this is that physical confirmation does matter. It does affect how much that animal produces across her lifetime and it keeps her in the herd longer. And the classification system really helps to quantify these economically important differences as well. A million cows in over 5,000 herds across 20 years is a really powerful data set. We didn't just look at this in, in a couple of herds. This is a large data set where we tried to account for as many possible factors as we could to address statistically what these differences really were. And we think and we hope that this data set will help drive home the importance of classification and its value to individual traits and individual farms. Just a kind of summary of some of the take home messages. These are the things that really come out from the data set as the most important traits for lifetime energy corrected milk. Rear udder height, rear udder width, fore udder attachment, dairy form, foot angle, and udder cleft. These are the, the six traits that really jump to the forefront when we're looking at lifetime energy corrected milk. And I think as an industry, we should really be focusing more and more on this KPI, key performance indicator of lifetime energy corrected milk, because if we have animals that produce a lot of milk, we want them to do that over a longer period of time. It's more profitable to a certain point for them to be able to do that. So how can we use this information? 
think we should recognize that considering type and confirmation and breeding decisions doesn't necessarily mean you're breeding for tall show cows. That's one of the, the misnomers. And when some people that say that they don't care about type or confirmation and say, I'm, I'm not trying to breed a show winner, that's fine. We all have different goals. But it's still important for everybody that milks cows to breed for functional type. These are factors that we should consider in our breeding and culling decisions. There's no doubt from looking at this data set that utter, feet and legs, and dairy form, which I would consider to be somewhat functional traits, have a clear impact on lifetime profitability. And confirmation traits should be considered in combination with production and fitness traits using an index like PPI, net merit, or daughter wellness profit. Classification also helps provide additional decision-making criteria within your dairy data toolbox. I hope that you've gotten something interesting out of this. It's been a fun data set to work with and really been great to talk to people about this data set since we released it a few months ago and the results that we found. If you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to contact me by phone or email, my contact information is there. And as I mentioned, the uh, full results of the study, all the graphs of every different combination, there's any question you have about, well, what does this trait relate to this particular output? You can find all of that information at the website there listed at the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions that you guys may have at this point. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so if anybody does have questions they would like uh, Dr. Buley to answer, there's a box at the bottom where you can enter in Q&A. We did just have somebody um, input a question that I'll give Jeffrey in just a second, but please um, enter any questions you have and we've got a few minutes now where we can handle those. Uh, so uh, Dr. Buley, we had one question that says, um, do bigger show style cows milk better or are there likes of Lionel and Tahiti outliers? Okay, so I think one of the things when we think about bigger, we should think about that big means different things. So they're different dimensions of the cow. And one of the things that the data set shows, a lot of people when they think about big, they think about stature. And it does show that stature is negative for um, lifetime energy production milk. So the, the very tallest cows don't produce as much lifetime energy corrected milk. Um, some of the other things that we might factor into being bigger would be things like strength and width. And those relationships, really, when we look across the data set, were pretty neutral. They weren't major influences on uh, lifetime energy corrected milk or first lactation energy corrected milk. So I, I don't think that there should be any take home message that says that we should or should not read for. Uh, bigger show style cows. I think that's a personal preference. If some people want to breed that type of an animal, that's okay. Uh, but it does show that functionally correct animals produce more milk across their, their lifetime. And I think that what the point that I was trying to make is that people that think that type means or confirmation means big, tall show cows, that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about functionally correct animals. All right, thank you. Uh, we had another question come in. From the data you analyzed, do you find that the current weights on different traits are accurate or do you think that there should be adjustments? That's a really good question. Um, I think that we could look at that a little bit more, but I guess overall I would say that, that when you consider that the, the type classification breakdown now is heavily weighted for udder, and that our results show that the udder really is the most important part for uh, functionally correct animals for lifetime energy corrected milk and how long the animal stays in the herd, along with some emphasis on, on feet and legs and, and some emphasis on, on body traits. I think there's probably some support that we, have, we are at least on the right track, but uh, there could be some adjustments made there. I, I don't 
I don't know the, the long term answer for that, but that's a great question. All right, uh, another one just came in. Uh, what are your thoughts on AAA and how do they relate to the results of this study? I have to be honest, I'm, I'm not all that familiar with AAA. I, I'm familiar with the concept. Um, I, I, so I, I don't have, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. All right, thank you. Um, we can hang out there. That was the last question that came in. We can hang out for a couple more minutes. If anybody has questions that they would like to put in the question box, uh, we've got a few minutes for that. Otherwise, I think we can wrap up. Thanks so much, everybody, for your attendance today. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. If there's anything that we can do to help you or, or any of the people that you work with, then uh, again, please reach out. We're happy to talk to you, happy to, to talk to other groups or, or other conferences or, or students or whatever that you have about this, this results, because I think it's very interesting and a, a very powerful data set. All right, we did have a, a late breaking question come in here. Um, so this person asks, was there a noticeable correlation with thorough width and rear utter height and width? We didn't look specifically at, at the correlation between traits. We were looking more between the trait and our um, economic indicators of interest. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, if you if you want to send me an email, I can I can definitely go through the data and, and find that question for you. All right, very good. Well, that takes us to the bottom of our question list. Um, like I said, we can hang out for another minute or two if anybody has any last minute questions. Otherwise, to echo Dr. Bueller's comments, thank you all so much for your time and attention today. Uh, we did record this webinar, so we'll make that available on the Holstein website um, afterwards. And as Dr. Bueller mentioned, um, we do have the full results of the study published on our website. You can see the URL on the screen. So um, there's hundreds of pages of information there. So if, if you want to do a deep dive, we have all that information available for the public. Um, so we encourage you to check that out. Uh, thank you very much for attending our webinar today.